how do I relate this to myself? Um, how do you deal? This is an interesting question. Write it down. I'll let you think about it later. How do you deal with ennui? How do you deal with boredom? Right? Of course, this other line that, uh, what shall we ever do? This is a fascinating line, right? What shall we ever do? Reminds us of the proof rock line, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers roll. Do I dare to eat a peach? Um, the idea is, when we get to a certain point in our life, we wonder, as Proofrock asks, do I dare disturb the universe? <sighs> Proofrock will say, I've measured out my life in coffee spoons. My life is so unbelievably repetitive, so unbelievably boring, right? Students will sometimes resonate with this. Oh my gosh, this is my day. I wake up, I go to school, it's the same thing, day after day. And then when I finish my first year, it's like, okay, now I get to do it again. And then for students to graduate, it's like, okay, I get to go to college, and then I get to do it all over again, day after day. And then, of course, the question is, well, do you think adults have less boring lives? Do you think adults have lives that are not as repetitive and boring, day after day? What do you do with Henri? What do you do with boredom? How do you get over it? What shall we ever... Do. All right, here we go. Section three, write it in your notes. This one is called Fire Sermon. This one comes from, it's actually the name of a very famous sermon that was given by Gudama Buddha, the Buddha's most famous sermon, and many have compared it as the most famous sermon to Christ's Sermon on the Mount, all right? Now, what's up with this Fire Sermon? Well, the Buddha taught that humans kind of have that tendency to have that passion of fire always burning, and there has to be a way to somehow control that, to squelch that maybe even, so that one can find spiritual rebirth, spiritual liberation. Let's now turn, here we go, section three, the fire sermon. Follow along, this is a fascinating section as well. The river's tent is broken. The last fingers of leaf clutch and sink into the wet bank. The wind crosses the brown land unheard. The nymphs are departed. Sweet Thames run softly till I end my song. The river bears no empty bottles, sandwich papers, silk handkerchiefs, cardboard boxes, cigarette ends, or other testimony of summer nights. The nymphs are departed and their friends, the loitering heirs of city directors, departed, have left no addresses. By the waters of Leman I sat down and wept. Sweet Thames, run softly till I end my song. Sweet Thames, run softly, for I speak not loud or long. But at my back in a cold blast I hear the rattle of the bones and chuckles spread from ear to ear. A rat crept softly through the vegetation, dragging its slimy belly on the bank while I was fishing in the dull canal on a winter evening round behind the gas house, musing upon the king my brother's wreck and on the king my father's death before him. White bodies naked on the low damp ground and bones cast in a little low, dry garret, rattled by the rat's foot only year to year. But at my back from time to time I hear the sound of horns and motors, which shall bring the Sweeney to Mrs. Porter in the spring. Oh, the moon shone bright on Mrs. Porter and on her daughter. They washed their feet in soda water. Et oh, ces voix d'enfants chantant dans la coupole. city. Under the brown fog of a winter noon, Mr. Eugenides, the Smyrna merchant, unshaven, with a pocket full of currents, CIF London, documents at sight, asked me in demotic French to luncheon at the Cannon Street Hotel, followed by a weekend at the Metropole. At the violet hour, when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, when the human engine waits like a taxi throbbing, waiting, I, Tiresias, though blind, throbbing between two lives, old man with wrinkled female breasts, 
Can see at the violet hour, the evening hour, that strives homeward and brings the sailor home from sea. The typist home at tea time, clears her breakfast, lights her stove and lays out food in tins. Out of the window perilously spread her drying combinations touched by the sun's last rays. On the divan a pile at night her bed, stockings, slippers, camisoles and stays. I, Tiresias, old man with wrinkled dugs, perceived the scene and foretold the rest. I too awaited the expected guest. He, the young man, carbuncular, arrives. A small house agent's clerk, with one bold stare, one of the low on whom assurance sits as a silk hat on a Bradford millionaire. The time is now propitious, as he guesses. The meal is ended, and she is bored and tired, endeavors to engage her in caresses which still are unreproved, if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once. Exploring hands encounter no defense. His vanity requires no response, and makes a welcome of indifference. And I, Tiresias, have foresuffered all enacted on this same divan or bed. I, who have sat by Thebes below the wall, and walked among the lowest of the dead. Bestows one final patronizing kiss, and gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit. She turns and looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. Her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Well, now that's done, and I'm glad it's over. When lovely woman stoops to folly and paces about her room again alone, she smooths her hair with automatic hand and puts a record on the gramophone. This music crept by me upon the waters and along the strand up Queen Victoria Street. Oh, city, city, I could sometimes hear, beside a public bar in Lower Thames Street, the pleasant whining of a mandolin, and a clatter and a chatter from within, where fishmen lounge at noon, where the walls of Magnus Martyr hold inexplicable splendor of Ionian white and gold. The river sweats, oil and tar, the barges drift, with the turning tide, red sails wide to lured, swing on the heavy spar. The barges wash, drifting logs down Greenwich Reach, past the Isle of Dogs. Why la 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 Elizabeth and Leicester beating oars, the stern was formed, a gilded shell, red and gold, the brisk swell rippled both shores. Southwest wind carried downstream, the peal of bells, white towers. Wa-la-la, liar. Wa-la-la, liar, la la Trams and dusty trees, Highbury bore me, Richmond and Kew undid me. By Richmond I raised my knees, supine on the floor of a narrow canoe. My feet are at Morgate, and my heart under my feet. After the event, he wept. He promised a new start. I made no comment. What should I resent? On Margate Sands, I can connect nothing with nothing. The broken fingernails of dirty hands. My people, humble people who expect nothing. La. La. To Carthage then I came, burning, 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 burning. O oh Lord, thou pluckest me out. O oh Lord, thou pluckest burning. All right, let's turn now to section three, and let's pay attention now to a few ideas as we go through this one. Notice here at section three, we began with rivers. So let's write this in our notes right away. We're going to see the importance of rivers now in this 
in this uh, poem. We're going to see it here. We're going to see it again in the, uh, in the final section as well. So we're going to go from the Thames River, which is the major river of, uh, that runs right through London. And then we're going to end in the fifth section with the Ganges River, which is the famous river of India, right? Only now... The Thames, the Thames uh, River is a nasty river. It's not this beautiful river that it once was. By the way, some students have pointed out that at line 175, the, the nymphs are departed. We'll come back to that line. Sweet Thames, run softly till I end my song. Um, the river bears no empty bottles, sandwich papers, silk handkerchiefs, cardboard boxes, cigarette ends. In other words, is he saying that the river is clean and doesn't have bears, no, none of those things. No, no, the opposite, okay? In other words, what he's saying is that this stuff doesn't get carried at the top, but rather it starts to sink, making it an even more disgusting uh, and, and disgusting river. Maybe think about the Hudson or something like that, right? Um, notice here, no nymphs. I read those lines. The wind crosses the brown land unheard. The nymphs are departed. You know, we immediately think, of course, of Prufrock and his mermaids, the nymphs. I do not think they will sing for me to go back to that lecture um, that I've already given. Notice the word departed. That is to say, changed. In other words, we got a guy sitting at the river fishing, and what he's doing, of course, is he's aware. Everything is changing. This doesn't look the way that it used to look. This used to be such a beautiful place. The rattle of the bones takes us to the rats. Notice the whole thing with Sweeney and Mrs. Porter, the whole notion of sex and shallow relationships. At line 200, we're again back to Philomel and the myth about the young lady who has been, uh, who has been uh, raped. And then, unreal city. And the idea of the unreal city is going to be an important one, both at line 206 and then again at line 259. In other words, let's put it in our notes this way. Eliot argued, he wasn't alone here, that cities have a tendency to dehumanize us, to make us less and less like real people. And in fact, Eliot argued, cities have a tendency to kind of look like more and more the topography of Dante's hell, Dante's inferno, where people can't talk to each other, can't share things with each other. Of course, those of us who live in cities, we are quick to point out, this is not true at all. And in fact, people are very kind who live in cities. And people can be just as nice who live in cities as who live in small towns. The debate, however, here it is for us, right? Unreal city. Finally, at line 218, we meet Tiresias, right? Three times we're going to have I, Tiresias. And the notion here is, he's been there all alone. It's just we didn't realize it. Who again is Tiresias? He's lived the life of both a man as well as a woman. He's cursed with blindness, but he's also provided us with the capacity to see. What is it that he sees? Well, again, it's a sex scene, isn't it? But it's a sex scene that's kind of really sad. The young man, carbuncular, pimples all over his face, shows up. He has a hat that um, makes him think that he's all that, when in fact he's really not. Notice as well, when he shows up after the meal, he's ready to make his move. We're told here that he will try and figure out exactly how he will assault at once, by the way, just the genius Bradford um, is the industrial town in North England that produced so much of the, for the war effort and some people made a serious amount of money. So notice that whole notion of juxtaposing the economics with the money of Bradford and now you've got the young man and he's going to assault. Again, it takes us back to Philomel. In other words, sex for modernity, for Eliot, is about an assault. It's not about love. And here he is, ready to make his move. By the way, this takes us back to the lines from Prufrock. Should I, after cakes and teas and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? Uh, the idea then is, should I make the move? And sure enough, he makes the move. And then he does the deed. And then he gropes, it's an interesting verb, his way, finding the stairs unlit. In other words, he leaves the apartment. And there, there are no lights, it, obviously a cheap apartment. And he can't find his way. It's as if he's blind. We're back to Tiresias and Tiresias' blindness. Once he's gone, she turns. And now we're back to this woman that we saw in the last section who's kind of sitting in the beautiful room. Only here it's not a beautiful room. It's a cheap room. It's a small apartment. She looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. Her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. This is all she has to say about the sex. Well, now that's done. And I'm glad it's over. 
Then the line, when lovely woman stoops to folly and paces about her room again, alone. Uh, let's put it in our notes. In other words, there's this constant theme of loneliness in this. We're, we're, I mean, we're surrounded by people, which makes the distinction that many students in 303 have pointed out. There's a huge difference between being alone and being lonely. But sometimes the word alone can also mean lonely. And you get this sense here, right? There she is, alone. She smooths her hair. Go back to section 2, line 107, and we're back there with hair again. You'll maybe remember from my comments from P uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, hair matters in Paradise Lost. Hair also matters as well in this poem. We're going to see it several times even in the fifth section. We're going to see it as well, right? With automatic hand. In other words, life becomes kind of automatic in the modern world. And then puts a record on the gramophone. In other words, she turns on her playlist, if you will, right? That is to say, after it's over, she's ready to kind of go to the music. Look at the next line, though. This music. And then look at the word crept by me. Back to the rats who are creeping, right? Along the strand up Queen Victoria Street. And then again, it's, oh, city, city. That is to say, uh, the city is losing its ability. How about the whole notion of clatter and chatter? Back to this notion of the bar makes us think about the sounds of the bar. We're going to make more about this where he has, Elliot, has two words. I'm making a to be observation. Has these two words, clatter and chatter. We're going to see more of this here in a little bit. Now we've got a Queen Elizabeth reference. And I'll let you do more research on this. But the idea is that Queen Elizabeth, there was a guy who actually tried to maybe, you know, um, tell her that she should marry him on the river. We've got more sex in a canoe at line 295. At line uh, 301, notice, uh, I cannot, she, um, it's, it's said this way, I can connect nothing with nothing. A, good, a bit of irony given the way we define learning in 303 is the ability to connect new to old. The broken fingernails of dirty hands my people, humble people, who expect nothing. If there is a single word that is the mantra for this text, it is the word nothing, right? Which again takes us back to the word ennui. What is it when you're bored? You have, you can fill in the blank, blank to do, boredom. You have nothing to do, right? Um, uh, and, and then to finish um, at line 306, we got juxtapositions bringing together of two really important, significant religious figures. To Carthage that I came is an actual line from St. Augustine's Confessions. St. Augustine, the greatest Christian theologian. Okay? And I've given lectures on confessions. You can find those on Learn Strong under the Harvard Classics folder. The interesting thing about St. Augustine from the Confessions is that he tells us long after, the, now he's a, you know, he's a famous church father when he writes confessions, right? He tells about when he was young and he had a prayer that he made to God as he was trying to become a true Christian and it was, give me self-temperance that is to say, help me to not want sex all the time, but not yet, he says in his prayer. That notion of I can't overcome the passions that I have to Carthage, then I came North Africa. Then the other line comes specifically from the Buddha's fire sermon, burning, burning, thou pluckest me out, and then final line of, uh, final word of the line, burning. Also, make a note to yourself, we got no punctuation at the end of the word burning. Did you notice that? As the section ends. It's almost as if Eliot could say, this could keep going on for a really long time, right? All right, well, let's finish now at level 2A. Things change, no question, but for Eliot, they don't evolve, they Devolve. Let's write that one down. Things get worse. They don't get better, right? We have lots of sex, of course, in this uh, section, but we have no love, right? We are reminded of those lines from the hollow man, lips that would kiss, form prayers to broken stone. In other words, there is a loss of love that associates as well with a loss of the capacity to believe in faith and religion. Again, nothing with nothing. We're back to Shakespeare's Lear. Nothing comes from nothing, right? At level 2B, well, we've got our illusions obviously going on here. Tiresias at line 248, the boy again groping his way, much like Tiresias. It's a brilliant moment in the poem. 
Again, the proof rock line, should I make the move, the clatter and the chatter, that we call alliteration, the repetition, right, of initial consonant sounds, all of that. And three, I have mentioned it already, St. Augustine and the Buddha. This is an amazing modern text for this reason. Let's put this in our nose. And this was a compelling text for that very reason. The challenge was to bring East and West together, and in this final moments of the, of the third section, he certainly does that, right? Okay, at 3B, how about this one? This is an interesting question. It's a disturbing question, but I'll ask it nonetheless. Do you think it's true that there is a difference between hooking up and love? Some have made the distinction between lust and love. You'll remember in our conversations with Plato and his theory of the forms that we had two different boxes that we represented the world as, right? In the first box, those things which are physical. In the second box, those things which are metaphysical. And certainly in the first box, we would put sex. But in the second box, we would put love. Do you think of them as the same or are they different? And if they are different, you know, different in, in what way? Also, do you think that life, school for example, is a connecting of nothing to nothing? In other words, is it possible you could go through school and learn lots and lots of stuff and it have no real meaning, no real value of any kind? In your life, jot this question down, in your schooling, what have you actually learned that had any meaning for you? Real meaning, real value. And why is it that we have so little meaning, so little value in our life? All right, let's go to section four, death by water. Again, we've already said it in our schemata as we were setting it up. This is without question the shortest of the five sections. Some students have said it's their favorite as well. Now that you are into this poem, I'm going to challenge you. Watch this, watch this. Now that you're into this poem, I'm going to challenge you to read this section very, very closely, and let's see if you can understand what's being said. I've had students that say, if I can get through the first three sections, the fourth section here actually reads as some of the most beautiful poetry I've ever read. What does a body that's drowned and lying at the bottom of the ocean look like in your mind's eye? The body is drowned. It's gone.